Hello again, and welcome to another lecture from CyberMD. In this lecture, we will be discussing the ANCA, or anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody associated vasculitides. These include granulomatosis with polyangiitis, formerly known as Wegener's, microscopic polyangiitis, and eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, also known as Churg-Strauss. Please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to our content so that we can continue to provide free medical education resources to students around the world. Before we get started, let's quickly review vascular anatomy. First, let's talk about the layers of the blood vessel wall. The innermost layer is called the intima, which is made up of epithelial cells that rest on a basement membrane. Moving on to the middle layer of the vessel wall, known as the media, it is composed of smooth muscle cells. Finally, we have the outermost layer of the vessel wall, the adventitia, which is made up of connective tissue. Disruption of the intima can lead to thrombosis or the formation of blood clots due to exposure of subendothelial collagen, which can obstruct blood flow and lead to tissue ischemia or oxygen deprivation. Additionally, chronic inflammation of the cells composing the vasculature may result in fibrosis, which may also lead to ischemia as the lumen of the vasculature narrows. Okay, let's get started with our pathologies. The first pathology we will be discussing is granulomatosis with polyangiitis. This vasculitis is a type of ANCA-associated vasculitis characterized by necrotizing granulomatous inflammation of the small vessels. It's in the name, granulomatosis, so you have granulomas with polyangiitis affecting multiple different small vessels. So the granulomas are non-caseating, and the disease is caused by the aberrant expression of proteinase 3 on the cell membrane of neutrophils. This abnormal expression will subsequently lead to the formation of antibodies against proteinase 3, known as a PR3 ANCA, which is confusingly a C ANCA. Again, PR3 ANCA, proteinase 3 ANCA, is confusingly a C ANCA. For testing purposes and with regards to this lecture, there is P ANCA and C ANCA. P ANCA is perinuclear, while C ANCA is cytoplasmic. So when photos are taken uh, of immunofluorescence, the P ANCA will light up around the nucleus because it's perinuclear, while C ANCA lights up the border of the cell in the cytoplasm near the cell membrane. So remember that PR3 ANCA is actually a type of C ANCA, especially when we're talking about the immunofluorescent results. Now, granulomatosis with polyangiitis has a peak incidence of 40 to 60 years old, and the disease affects both males and females pretty much equally. On exams, however, it's classically a male that they're going to give you that is affected with this, but be aware it can be male or female. Patients who have granulomatosis with polyangiitis often present with constitutional symptoms, including fevers, night sweats, arthralgias, weight loss. They may also present with localized manifestations, such as an otitis media, certain ocular conditions, uh, chronic sinusitis or rhinitis, as well as some skin lesions. The chronic rhinitis and sinusitis may cause nasopharyngeal ulcerations, a nasal septum perforation, and a saddle nose deformity. Chronic otitis and or mastoiditis may also occur. In some cases, patients may have thick, purulent discharge that sometimes contains blood. Patients with granulomatosis with polyangiitis may also develop strawberry gingivitis, lower respiratory tract complications, oral ulcers, and they will often have renal involvement. The lower respiratory tract complications can be life-threatening in these patients and may present as treatment-resistant pneumonia uh, with symptoms such as cough, uh, hemoptysis, wheezing, dyspnea, uh, pleuritic chest pain, hoarseness. Uh, in addition, clinical features of uh, things such as pulmonary fibrosis, pulmonary hemorrhage, or pulmonary hypertension uh, may be apparent. Uh, the renal involvement in patients with this disease can also be life-threatening uh, and often presents as a uh, pouchy immune glomerulonephritis with rapidly progressive or crescentic glomerulonephritis, excuse me, uh, possibly with pulmonary renal syndrome as well. 
Um, and this typically causes hematuria as well as red blood cell casts shown on the screen here. Uh, in general, what you should remember about all of this is that patients who have this are going to classically present with symptoms that involve one, the upper respiratory tract or the sinuses, two, the lungs, and three, the kidneys. If you see involvement of these three systems in a patient and the rest of the clinical and laboratory findings are correlating, you should be highly suspicious for granulomatosis with polyangiitis. Uh, laboratory testing is used to help in the diagnosis of these patients. Uh, the following lab findings uh, may be observed in patients with this condition. Uh, you can have elevated ESRs and CRPs, uh, elevated BUN and creatinine. Uh, you can have the evidence of the PR3 ANCA, which again is a C ANCA, um, and that's a highly sensitive and uh, is positive in about 90% of the patients. Uh, you can see anemia, specifically a normocytic, normochromic anemia, uh, and that makes sense both in the sense that there is renal damage uh, and in the sense that it could be an anemia of chronic disease. Um, your urinalysis may show proteinuria or hematuria, and you may see some urine sediment as well. Diagnosis of granulomatosis with polyangiitis is based on the laboratory testing, the imaging, and the biopsy of the affected organs. Uh, again, it's mostly based on the biopsy of the affected organs. You have to have that. Um, imaging, such as a chest x-ray or a CT scan, can sometimes show like these cavitating lesions um, bilaterally uh, in the lungs. Uh, the nail in the coffin, however, though, is if you have some kind of PR3 ANCA antibodies and you have a biopsy, those two things together are really going to nail the diagnosis. Uh, the biopsy is necessary and typically shows the classic triad of necrotic, partially granulomatous vasculitis of small and sometimes medium-sized vessels. Um, these necrotizing granulomas can be both intravascular and extravascular and are mainly going to be occurring in the lung and the upper airways. Granulomatosis with polyangiitis is treated with immunosuppressive drugs, typically consisting of glucocorticoids combined with like a cyclophosphamide or a methotrexate or a rituximab. Uh, the choice of immunosuppressive agent depends on the severity of the disease. Uh, for mild disease, glucocorticoids plus methotrexate uh, is typically used, and then for moderate or severe disease, you can uh, substitute that methotrexate for cyclophosphamide or rituximab. Uh, classically on the exams, though, they're going to say that you're going to give these patients uh, cyclophosphamide. Uh, it's important to note that uh, relapses for these patients are pretty common. Uh, and the glucocorticoids should be tapered gradually as soon as the patient begins responding to the immunosuppressant regimen. Uh, sometimes it's uh, necessary to give these patients uh, PCP or PJP prophylaxis uh, with TMP SMX, also known as Bactrim. Uh, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage is a very common cause of death in these patients. Uh, the one-year survival rate without adequate treatment is less than 20%, uh, but if you give patients with this condition adequate treatment, the five-year survival rate is pretty good, uh, approximately 80%. Next, we'll be discussing microscopic polyangiitis, which is, again, an ANCA-associated small vesicle vasculitis. Uh, it's characterized by necrotizing vasculitis of the small vessels, typically with pulmonary and renal and skin involvement. Uh, its manifestations are going to be very similar to granulomatosis with polyangiitis. However, the nasopharynx, these upper respiratory symptoms, uh, are usually not going to be occurring. So this is going to like spare the nasopharynx. Uh, there's no sinusitis, there's no rhinitis, anything like that. Uh, additionally, there's not going to be any granuloma formation in this condition. Uh, this can be a distinguishing feature, uh, and it's evident in the name. Uh, the other two vasculitides that we are covering in this lecture mention granulomas in the name. This one does not. Uh, microscopic polyangiitis is a relatively rare condition, uh, but the average onset is between 50 and 60 years of age. Uh, the typical clinical features of microscopic polyangiitis include pulmonary vasculitis, uh, pouchy immune glomerulonephritis, and palpable purpura. Uh, pouchy immune indicates the relative lack of immunoglobulin and complement deposition within the kidney, uh, as is demonstrated by indirect immunofluorescent techniques. And then palpable purpura are visible non-blanching hemorrhages that are raised and are able to be touched or felt upon palpation. 
Uh, patients may also present with constitutional symptoms such as weight loss, fever, and fatigue. Uh, other clinical features can include abdominal pain. Uh, there's neurological symptoms that can happen such as mononeuritis multiplex or a uh, symmetric polyneuropathy. Now, to diagnose this condition, you're primarily going to rely on your clinical findings, but you're also going to use laboratory and imaging studies as well. Uh, inflammatory markers, uh, such as your CRP and your ESR, are typically elevated. Uh, you can have like a leukocytosis, an anemia, or a thrombocytosis. Uh, however, the ANCA that this is associated with is most commonly an MPO ANCA, so an anti-myeloperoxidase ANCA. That's going to be present in up to 75% of patients with, myelo, uh, with microscopic polyangiitis. Uh, I remember that this is MPO ANCA because you can't spell microscopic without MPO. Uh, you should also know that this is a myeloperoxidase ANCA, as I mentioned earlier, and that's a P ANCA. Uh, this is just what has worked for me, uh, is kind of linking that MPO and microscopic myeloperoxidase and P ANCA. Uh, that helps me put this all together. Uh, CT of the chest is indicated in all patients uh, who have this condition and pulmonary symptoms, and it's typically typically going to have ground glass uh, opacifications or some kind of like nodular lesion. Um, in order to confirm the diagnosis, you have to get a biopsy, and you'll see the histopathology showing fibrinoid necrosis without granulomas. Again, without granulomas. Uh, the goal of pharmacotherapy, uh, which involves, again, immunosuppressive drugs like glucocorticoids uh, and a rituximab or methotrexate, but the purpose is always to induce remission. Um, and these patients, if they have really bad end organ damage, uh, it may warrant like a plasmapheresis as a form of treatment. Uh, microscopic polyangiitis can lead to several complications, uh, and these include nerve damage, kidney failure, and lung damage. So it's crucial to manage these complications quickly in order to prevent long-term morbidity and mor mortality. All right, and finally, let's talk about eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis. This is also known as Churg-Strauss syndrome. Uh, it's an ANCA-associated vasculitis of the small vessels that is characterized by necrotizing granulomatous vasculitis with eosinophilia. It's in the name. It most commonly involves the lungs and the skin, and most cases of Church-Strauss syndrome are idiopathic. Uh, the syndrome is rare, uh, but it's going to be more common in individuals between 30 and 50 years old. Uh, typically, it has a female predominance. So the clinical presentation of uh, Church-Strauss, or eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, is going to be divided into three different phases. Uh, there's going to be the prodromal phase, which is characterized by uh, a allergic attacks and asthma attacks, uh, rhinitis, sinusitis. Uh, these patients are often going to have a history of asthma or some other uh, atopy, uh, especially on their exam. The eosinophilic phase comes next, and that's going to include a lot of like pericarditis or lung disease, uh, bleeding, GI involvement, ischemia, uh, perforation of the bowel. Those sorts of things will be happening during the eosinophilic phase. And that's going to be followed finally by the vasculitic phase, which is going to include skin nodules, uh, mononeuritis multiplex, palpable purpura, and again, a pouchy immune glomerulonephritis. Uh, constitutional symptoms are often going to be present throughout all three of those phases, and features from all three phases may be present at the same time, and they don't necessarily follow a specific order. Um, it's important to note that eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis is associated with antineutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies and polyneuropathy, uh, such as like a foot or a wrist drop. Um, it's also associated with, again, like allergic rhinitis, sinusitis, asthma, uh, but most importantly, this eosinophilia is going to keep back and uh, keep coming back and keep haunting you. Uh, and that's really what's going to set this apart from other conditions, as well as increased IgE levels. Uh, relevant lab findings uh, are going to include, uh, again, eosinophilia, again, increased IgE levels. Uh, you will possibly see an MPO ANCA in this condition, uh, but you should use the clinical features to separate it from microscopic polyangiitis. Uh, again, remember that this condition is going to have a P ANCA. Uh, High-resolution CT of the chest, as well as a echo, 
are required to assess for cardiac as well as pulmonary involvement. Um, imaging studies can show like pulmonary infiltrates, they can show bronchial wall thickening, uh, ground glass opacities, it can show bronchiectasis. Um, but however, biopsy of the affected tissue, it, again, as with all of these conditions in this lecture, biopsy is required to confirm the diagnosis, and you're going to see a necrotizing vasculitis that has eosinophilic infiltration as well as uh, fibrinoid necrosis. Uh, there may be some extravascular necrotizing granulomas as well, as well as the extravascular tissue eosinophilia. So again, with our pharmacotherapy in these patients, we're trying to induce a state of remission uh, using immunosuppressive agents, including glucocorticoids uh, and cyclophosphamide. Again, if it gets bad enough, you can use plasmapheresis in these patients if there's some uh, kind of like really rapid renal failure or really bad pulmonary hemorrhage. Um, the complications uh, include renal failure and pulmonary hem hemorrhage, as well as some cardiac involvement, and that can all be very life-threatening. Uh, I hope this lecture helped, and please remember to like, comment, and subscribe to our content so that we can continue to provide free medical education resources to students around the world. Thanks for tuning in, and have an awesome day.